Photography by Peter Clark and this is the ISBN number. So this is Keynes by Peter Clark, The Rise, Fall and Return of the 20th Century's Most Influential Economist. Hannah Reed from the cover. Here, I John Maynard Keynes has enjoyed a roller coaster reputation. His idea helped inspire the New Deal as America's, America struggled out of the Great Depression, yet were ignored in his home country, Britain, until the Second World War. They were subsequently hailed as the basis of a so-called Keynesian consensus in the 1960s. Even Milton Friedman, even Milton Friedman said, we are all Keynesians now, that lasted until it was swept away by the Thatcherism in Britain and Reaganomics in the United States. Then came the great meltdown of 2008. Market forces that the world relied upon suddenly failed to self-correct and Keynes's doctrine of remedial action in an imperfect world became more relevant than ever. Pundits and politicians alike returned to Keynes's work seeking wisdom for a new and tumultuous time. And I will read from some of the pages here, some of the, or some what, what he's written. One, uh, this is, he writes, what is already clear is that Keynes was neither a dogmatic dogmatic adherent of free trade nor a reliable convert to the merits of protection. But the slump that was ravaging the world economy by 1933 certainly fed into his disillusion and international financial orthodoxy, orthodoxies. The divorce between ownership and the real responsibility of management is serious within a country when, as a result of joint stock enterprise, ownership is a broken up ownership is broken up between innumerable individuals who buy their interest today and sell tomorrow and lack altogether both knowledge and responsibility towards what they momentarily own wrote Keynes. But when the same principle is applied internationally, it is in times of stress, intolerable, and irresponsible towards what I own, and those who operate what I own are irresponsible towards me. Such a system now stood as a self-evident failure. It is not intelligent, it is not beautiful, it is not just, it is not virtuous, and it doesn't deliver the goods. He wrote, Robbins, speaking to a joint Anglo-American session at the Bretton Woods Conference, uh, wrote, uh, said, at such moments I often find myself thinking that Keynes must be one of the most remarkable men that have ever lived. The quick logic, the bird-like swoop of intuition, the vivid fancy, the wide vision above all, the incomparable sense of the fitness of words all combined to make something several degrees beyond the limit of ordinary human achievement. He uses the classical style of our life and language. It is true, but it is sh shot through with something which is not traditional, a unique, unearthly quality of which one can only say that it is pure genius. The American sat entranced as a godlike visitor sang and the golden light played around. Such magic can be potent but ephemeral. The spell that is 
podcast may not last long, especially not outlast the death of the spellbinder. How much did Cain's influence owe to his own charismatic past? How far might his own death be expected to diminish the influence of the ideas that he left behind? Alternatively, why has the influence of Cain's ideas so resiliently survived his own death more than 60 years ago? So these are some of the questions. Read the book. It is really so interesting. Talking about Pigo, less than six years older than Keynes, he seemed already of an older generation, stiff in his manner, cautious in his scholarship. Keynes's later work took him as representative of the classical school, devoting seven pages of the general theory to a demolition of Pigou's The Theory of Unemployment, 1933. Of all the economists whom Keynes might have chosen as the straw man of orthodox economics to be publicly knocked down, he chose Pigou, the bearer of the Marshallian flame, his colleague in the Cambridge Economics faculty, and a fellow of King's College like Keynes himself. It was a small world. Pigou had been more generous when he received a reviewed Keynes's treatise saying that it provided an account of the modus operandi of bank rate much superior as it seems to me to previous discussions. True enough and from an impeccably or orthodox source. For at this time Keynes's real achievement was not any theoretical innovation of his own, but his lucidly cogent analysis of how the conventional theoretical mechanisms worked or failed to work in practice. The fact is that the treatise was not an as what was not as incompatible with orthodox economic theory as its author imagined it to be at the time. Little wonder that Schumpeter considered it Keynes's best book. Its rhetoric was challenging, but its great analytical strength as Keynes's presentation of it to the Macmillan committee brought out was its lucid account of the mechanisms by which the monetary system which was supposed to work, especially the gold standard. It was an extraordinarily clear exposition. The chairman congratulated Keynes. Keynes told the Macmillan committee that there were seven possible remedies given Britain's current predicament. And uh, he also, one was indeed abandoning the parity of, for uh, parity and undoing the bad decision of 1925. Uh, and uh, another thing was that he said sixth was his, uh, the, his favorite. So talking about these remedies. However, Keynes now regarded devalu devaluation as a last resort. Second possibility was what later came, became known as incomes policy. This would involve a national treaty to bring down all wages immediately to the required level rather than leaving such adjustment to the slow and haphazard workings of the market. Keynes regarded this as equitable in theory, but impractic in impracticable, a verdict that subsequent Keynesian experiments uh, with income policies, especially in the 1960s and 70s in both 
Britain and the USA have done little to qualify. A third remedy was bounties to industry. This was functionally equivalent in so far as it meant subsidizing wages in vulnerable industries, especially those most keenly subject to competition from overseas, thus spreading the pain across the whole community rather than letting one group of workers suffer. A fourth remedy, rationalization, was so vague that almost anybody, including Montague Norman, could uh, readily agree to it. It was a vogue word for schemes to cut unit costs, especially through economies of scale and so far as it would it meant greater efficiency it was a fine panacea everybody nodded if only through weariness so next was tariffs their possible relevance to a slump was timeless what country was not heard the protectionist cry when facing hard times British jobs for British workers and buy American are the sort of slogans that have been around for a long time. Fears of exporting jobs to lower paid workers overseas are not new. The belief that protectionist tariffs can increase home employment has often sounded plausible except to economists. Then talks about um, for Keynes. Uh, okay, uh, the sixth remedy he talked about was a policy that he talked about was home investment or public works. Keynes came clean and calling it my favorite remedy, the one. To which I attach much the greatest importance. It was the option available to a country under the special case of the treatise when a jam or a hitch in the workings of the gold standard mechanism thwarted the achievement of equilibrium by the natural process of market adjustments. But actually it was simpler than that. It always seems to me that this argument is quite agreeable to common sense. Moreover, as Keynes put it, I think the first impetus forward must come from actions of this kind, that it must be government investment which will break the vicious circle. Finally, Keynes proposed international measures as a seventh remedy for the Macmillan Committee since high interest rates were the problem and since they were high because of international pressure, the obvious solution was international ag agreement by all the countries simultaneously to bring down interest rates. Like free trade, this seemed a simple means of increasing the wealth of nations to the benefit of all. Yes, it was simple but not easy. He told the committee that what I'm trying to do is to do justice to all the remedies that have been put forward. He said that I think, um, I, I said at the beginning that there was something to be said for all of them. So he says that I think um, at I think I said at the beginning that there was something to be said for all of them. And uh, he also writes or says that some of them are better than the some of some of them for uh, he does say that I'm in favor of practically all the remedies which have been suggested in there 
Some of them are better than others, but nearly all of them seem to tend in the right direction. The conclusion he draw, the conclusion he drew, was consistent in its scorn. That was his scorn for long-run strategies of inertia. So he he felt that any any long-run strategy that you have is is a reason for inertia. Uh, very interesting. Must read. Talking about general theory, there are only two direct references to budget deficit. One is almost an aside to the effect that a slum will be mitigated if the government willingly or unwillingly tolerates a deficit through, a, through its expenditure on unemployment relief payments. It is true that although British folk memory is of a miserly dole paid to workers who lost their jobs during the slump. The level of government support for the unemployed in Britain was high by international standards, certainly in comparison with the United States. And we now know that Keynes was correct in thinking that this made the impact of the depression in Britain relatively less severe. What Keynes was against was a self-defeating attempt to balance the budget in a recession by cuts that would inadvertently prolong it rather than achieve their professed objective. The second relevant passage in the general theory is more extensive. Here Keynes is uh, defending what he usually calls loan expenditure by government when faced with mass unemployment. This is the perennial argument about the Treasury view. Whether government is simply robbing an equivalent sum of private investment in a way that therefore seems wasteful unless government is better able than private enterprises to choose the right projects. In 1934, he defended Roosevelt's expenditure on public works and unemployment relief, creating the enormous so-called deficit, much of which, however, will be covered by valuable assets. Keynes certainly approved of loan expenditure of this kind, and he extended his disapproval to consumption once he had the multiplier concept clear. Spending is a two-sided transaction, he wrote at the end of 1934, anticipating the arguments of the general theory that it increases incomes all round. The predominant issue as I look at the matter, he told his American readers, is to get money spent. During the Second World War, Keynes was himself in the government service in Britain. By then, under American influence, the terms deficit finance and functional finance had become established. Some of the younger Keynesian economists working for the British government were much taken with such ideas and began arguing for the post-war regulation and demand through consumption. This would mean running deficits by cutting taxes in a recession. Keynes, however, continued to argue in favor of public investment in the infrastructure, preferably through instituting a capital budget to finance it, while leaving the ordinary budget in balance. He advised the Chancellor of the Exchequer to avoid confusing the fundamental idea of the capital budget with the particular rather desperate expedient of deficit financing. How interesting. So once again, how to pay for war, uh, 1940, an adaption of macroeconomic analysis to an economy in which the problem is no longer that of tackling deflation and unemployment, but of warding off the equal and opposite dangers of inflation and labor shortage. The war economy legitimized stimulus measures, notably loan-financed 
increases in public spending with government orders bringing uh, much of manufacturing industry into full production for the first time in years it was only logical therefore that Keynes's plan should have been addressed to restraining the prospective inflationary effect by expedients that would take excess consuming power out of the economy to this end he proposed not only high levels of progressive taxation but measures for deferred pay in effect a temporary withholding tax to be credited to payers of income tax after the war despite initial opposition from the labor movement a scaled down version was to be introduced in 1941 i'm a highly teachable person kane said on one occasion in 1940 i learned from criticism and been before now have laid myself open to the reproof that my second thoughts are often better than my first thoughts which is an and which is an indication some people think of a dangerous instability of character he did not cling to hidebound texts in face of changing circumstances he thought that there were worse offenses than hearsay and he recognized a need in every generation for fresh thinking about the agenda of economic policy there is no single static canonical version of keynesian's thought after the general theory as before it he refused to act as the pope of a new religion this is one reason why there is legitimate ground for taking different views of his legacy the varieties of keynesianism that subsequently flourished and sometimes withered were attempts to extend his ideas in trying to make them operational these were not the first doctrines to find their hubris meet met by nemesis as history unfolded we certainly ought to have qualms about too readily invoking the name of an economist who for more than 60 years has been unable to defend himself or clarify the meaning of his ideas we do not need the sort of anarchistic ventro ventriloquism that is liable to be displayed if we keep asking what would keynes think today Austin Robinson who knew him well as a senior colleague wrote in 1947 that it was an eff- effort to realize that Keynes who was in the 1930s so utterly of the younger generation had watched the funeral of Queen Victoria and still manifested traits which seemed almost Victorian personally in talking with Sir Austin nearly 40 years later i naturally regarded this spree uh, non non nigerian in his tennis shoes as himself a figure from a distant era seemingly remote from some of our current concerns and the world has moved on since then of course Keynes's legacy to the study of economics goes beyond doctrinal disputes indeed and the author peter clock ends by saying with so much help in its making this book ought to be the perfect introduction to a topic of inexhaustible fascination and any shortcomings are simply my own how beautiful so it's a must read book you must read it it's i just read out read out some paragraphs or some points from different pages and i'm sure when you read the book you'll come across these because i've just read them at just the way they have they are, have been written so thank you